Okay, hopefully I can finish the yellow review in one video here. So we're on number 23. It says, what are the vertical and horizontal asymptotes, uh, horizontal if any, asymptotes of f of x? All right, so in order for me to figure that out, I have to first factor the denominator. Okay, so when I take 4 and multiply it by 13, it's going to give me 52. So I need two numbers that multiply to give me 52. Add to give me 28. So it's going to be 2 and 26. So I have, well, why can't I write? I have 4x squared plus 28x. No, no, I'm just writing that. It's 2 and 26 is what I need. 26x plus 2x plus 13. So I'm going to take these two pieces, I can factor out a 2x here, so this has left me with 2x plus 13, I can factor out nothing here, well 1, so plus 1 times 2x plus 13, so that means that gives me 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 13. Okay, so that is what my denominator is in factored form. So taking the denominator and setting it, setting the factors equal to zero gives me my vertical asymptotes. So if I take 2x plus 1 and set it equal to zero, that means that x is equal to a negative 1 half, and 2x plus 13 equals zero, which means x equals a negative 13 halves. So my vertical asymptotes are at negative 1 half, negative 13 halves. Well, that's this is the only one that matches that. These show horizontal asymptotes, which you should know from the get-go that it does not have one because it is top-heavy. So if you looked at it that way, it would eliminate A and D from the beginning, and then you could guess if you're running out of time or clueless. But then when you factor that, C is the only option there. Alrighty. So, what best describes the end behavior of this graph here? All right, so it is a rational function. It is a quartic, but we have a denominator of x plus 1. So it's going to act like a cubic as far as this is concerned. And um, you can do a couple of different things here. I mean, you can just kind of understand what the end behavior looks like. You can also do a number line if you're not real sure what to do. Um, you can substitute infinity in and think about what's happening when it gets, um, when things get really, really big or really, really small. Since it's multiple choice, clearly infinity is an answer somewhere. So you just have to decide what's happening with the signs. That's really all that this is, this is getting into here. So if you, when the number gets really, 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 really big, right, and it's, I'm sorry, well, let's start really, really small. So as x approaches negative infinity, so the number is going to get infinitesimally small, right? The smaller and smaller it gets, I'm going to sub, it's a negative number, so the negative number to whatever it is, to the even power is going to make it positive, but the negative number down here makes it overall negative. So that means when x approaches negative infinity, it is going to approach negative, f of x approaches negative infinity. So these two are the only answer choices I get to keep. Then when it's positive, approaching positive infinity, so a huge positive number, then I'm going to, that's still going to be positive, and so is this, which means as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches infinity, so these I've already eliminated, so I'm only looking at these two here. It approaches infinity, it should be positive infinity, which is c. But if it's a quartic, once you, you know, divide it out, it's going to act like a cubic, and so a cubic looks like this, right? We're talking about end behavior. 
So when we're looking like this and it's positive, as x approaches infinity, y also approaches infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, y also approaches negative infinity. So that's another way to look at it. You could also do the little number line and, and substitute some things in, but that's how you could reason through it. All right, number 25. I want the limit of f of x as x approaches 8. So let's look at what happens with this denominator once I factor it. So if I factor this, this is going to give me x minus 2 over x times x squared minus 10x plus 16. So then I can factor the denominator more. I'm going to get x minus 2 over x times, so two numbers multiply, give me 16, negative 10, so it's going to be x minus 8 and x minus 2. So I need to figure out what's happening on this graph. Like if I wanted to sketch this graph, I don't necessarily have to sketch it or sketch the whole thing, but I do need to have an idea of what it is and know how to use those pieces. Well, this x minus 2 and this x minus 2, these reduce down. Okay, so that means there's a hole there. Does That hole really doesn't give me anything here. But that gives me then that I'm using 1 over x times x minus 8. So one of the things that we look at here, we know that we have a vertical asymptote at 8. So a couple of things could happen. Here's my vertical asymptote, right? The, the graph could look like this. The graph could look like this. Or at least at that point, I don't mean the whole graph. Or it could go opposite, like this. Or like this, all right? One of the things that we looked for when we were graphing rationals was tangency and togetherness. And so if you remember that um, that had to do with your double roots. And if you had a double root in the numerator, that means that you had tangency, okay, like a bounce. And then in the denominator, that would mean that you have togetherness. And so we have Togetherness would be like this, means that they're coming together instead of going in opposite directions. We do not have tangency or togetherness here, not that tangency would be part of this answer, but since I don't have that, that means it's going to look something like this. It doesn't even really matter what because it's not asking me if what's the limit as it approaches from the left or the right. Just in general, the um, it doesn't have a limit, so it does not exist. All right, number 26. Look at the function that is graphed below. Which of these statements about the function is true? Okay, so once again, make sure we're paying attention to whether we're looking for true or false here. It says the function is continuous. Clearly, not continuous. Bam, right there. Not my answer. The function is not continuous. Okay, I know it's not continuous. At x equals 1. Where at x equals 1, it is continuous there, so that's not my answer. A jump discontinuity exists at x equals 3. All right, well, at x equals 3, there is clearly a jump discontinuity. So I like C, but I still got to read D just in case they're both right. A two-sided limit exists as x approaches 3. Okay, so as x approaches 3 from the left, y approaches 4. As x approaches 3 from the right, y approaches 5. So since they don't match, they don't have a two-sided limit. They have a one-sided limit for each side, but not a two-sided limit. So that is not my answer, and the only answer is C. All right, radian measure of an angle x in degrees. All right, so if you have an angle and you want to change it to radians, you're going to multiply it by pi over 180. Remember, your only options are pi over 180 or 180 over pi, and if you're trying to get the pi in it, it's got to be in the numerator. All right, 28. Which functions are positive for angles terminating in the in quadrant 2? So I'm looking for quadrant 2 right here. Remember this is all students take calculus. All right, so I know sine is, so this says sine, I'm okay with that, but cosine is only positive in 1 and 4, so my answer is not A. Sine and secant, well, secant is a reciprocal of cosine, so if A doesn't work, B doesn't work either. Sine and tangent, nope, because it's just sine, but sine and cosecant, since cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, 
My answer is D. 29. The angle theta is in the first quadrant, and sine theta equals 3 divided by the square root of 34. Determine possible coordinates for point P on the terminal arm of theta. All right, so first quadrant. So we've got this. Right, here's theta. If it's sine, it is opposite over hypotenuse, so this is 3 and square root of 34. So this is my cosine value, right? So I've got to have to, I'm going to have to find that. This is my x value. Remember this here, that would be my y value. So my y value would have to be 3, right? So I don't like this one. I don't like that one. So it's one of these two. So then I have to solve for it. And that means that x squared plus 3 squared equals the square root of 34 squared. So x squared plus 9 equals 34. So when I subtract 9 from both sides, x squared equals 25. So x equals 5. So this point here, I have an x value of 5, y value of 3. Alrighty, sine theta is negative and cosine theta is negative. In which quadrant does the terminal side of theta lie? Alright, so here's my little coordinate plane. Sine negative, alright, so it's, they're all positive here. Sine is positive here, so sine's negative here and here. Cosine, all positive here. Sine's positive here, so cosine's negative. This is tangent, so cosine's negative. Cosine's positive here. So for when they're both negative, that would be right here, which is quadrant 3. Right, which of the following statements is true? 1 degree equals pi over 180 radians. 1 radian is pi over 80 degree, I'm sorry, 180 over pi degrees, both A and B, or neither A nor B. So if you're, remember that your degrees is equal to, if I have this here and I just multiply both sides by 180 to solve for pi there, then that means that I would have 180 degrees equals pi radians, and I think I could get on board with that. Here, if I multiply both sides by pi, I'm going to get pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. I think I could get on board with that too. So I like both of those, so it's A and B. Number 32. A central angle of 4 pi over 15 radians intercepts an arc whose degree measure is blank. Okay, so I am looking for arc measure here. And arc measure is different than arc length because we're looking for it in degrees. So you measure an arc in, uh, in degrees or radians, and then the length is where you get your feet and other stuff. So basically, it's just asking me to convert. And when you convert from radians to degrees, you're going to multiply. So I've got 4 pi over 15. So radians are the ones that have the pi in the measurement, so it means I have to multiply by 180 over pi so that the pi's cancel out. Remember, you're not going to have a calculator on this test, so you've got to be able to manipulate these things by hand. All right, so I can reduce before I multiply. I mean, you can do it a little bit at a time if you got to do it by fives, but 15 goes into 180. All right, 15 goes into 18 once with three left over, so then that's 30, and 15 goes into 30 twice, and so 15 goes into 15 once. So now when I multiply, I've just got 4 times 12 over 1, which is 48. Right, so then in 33, I'm just supposed to convert to degrees also. So 11 pi over 3 times 180 over pi. Pi's cancel out. 3 goes into 3 once, goes into 180 60 times. So 60 times 11, 660. So I want to solve this. Oh, dang it. All right, drop my pen. I got it. Oh, and it still works. That's just glorious. All right, so I want to solve this exponential equation, and I need to get this part of it by itself. So I need to divide by 3. So I'm going to get 27x equals 1 third. 
and then I want to make the two sides match so that 27, 27 is 3 to the third, but it has to match the 1 third to the 1 power, so that means it has to be negative. So if I do 1 third to the negative 3 power, that is the same as 27, still got that x up there, that's equal to 1 third to the first power. So since the bases are the same, negative 3x equals 1, and x equals negative 1 third. That is d. All right, so I'm going to solve for x here. So I'm going to rewrite this as an exponential. Remember, rewriting it in exponential form is not the same as the inverse. So I'm going to rewrite it. That means I'm going to have 5 to the third power equals x. So 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. 36. Log base 9 of 3 to the x power equals 8. What the value of x that satisfies this equation is blank. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this and just do 9 to the 8th power equals 3 to the x power. Now obviously I don't want to really find 9 to the 8th power, but 9 is 3 squared, so this is like 3 squared or 3 to the 2 times 8 power, which is equal to 3x, or I'm sorry, 3 to the x power. That just means that x equals 16. Okay, so in order to solve this one, I have to first condense them. So since this is addition, that can become multiplication. So I will get log base 2 of x minus 3 times x plus 1 equals 5. So that means that when I rewrite this one, 2 to the fifth power is equal to, and I'm going to go ahead and multiply this out, get x squared, that'd be minus 3x plus x, so that's minus 2x minus 3. Right, so 2 to the fifth power, remember you got to be able to do this without a calculator, so have a way to do it for yourself. So 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32. So 2 to the fifth power is 32. So if you don't just automatically know those things, make sure you can figure them out quickly. It's going to be 32, but I'm going to have to subtract it over here. Well, 32 equals x squared minus 2x minus 3. Okay, so I have a quadratic. I need to go ahead and move this over and set it equal to 0. So 0 equals x squared minus 2x minus 35. So when I factor that, I'm going to get x, so this is going to be a negative 7x plus 5. So that means my, my, the x's that I get, I get negative 5 and positive 7. But then I have to check them, right? So they, I know that they work in my quadratic here, but remember they have to work in the context of the original, original problem. When I take the negative 5 and I substitute it in here, it's going to give me a negative 8. So that would be log base 2 of negative 8. You can't take the log of a negative number. So 5 is an extraneous answer. Remember, it's, the negative ones aren't always extraneous because depending on what happens in there, maybe I could use it, but you got to check them. When I substitute 7 in, sometimes it's a positive that's extraneous. So I take this and substitute it in. That would give me the log of a positive number. That's good. Log of a positive number. We're good. So my only answer here then is... 7, which is C. All right, next page. Last page of this one. It says, which of the following graphs best represents the shape of the graph y equals e to the x? So that's just an exponential number. e is just a number. e is for easy. So the, just a generic parent graph of uh, an exponential looks like this. So it's a 39. Determine the equation of the asymptote of this function. So in order to understand that, you have to understand the parent function and the transformation. So the parent function of a log looks like something like that. Right now, my vertical asymptote is at x equals 0. All right? And there is no horizontal asymptote. There is only a vertical asymptote which means I can automatically eliminate B and D, and then I just have to know 
what my transformation happens, really. And remember, if it's x plus 3, that means it's a shift to the left. So as I shift this over to the left, the asymptote gets shifted over to the left as well. So it has to be x equals negative 3. All right, and then which is the equivalent exponential form? So it's just asking us to rewrite it. So you take the base, becomes the base of the exponential, to the x power equals n, and that matches this one. I would suggest, I know sometimes when things are easy like that, y'all don't even write anything down, you're just like, oh, that has to be the answer. But they're all the same things mixed around, and you can get mixed up on that stuff easily. So make sure you write it down and make it make sense. It didn't take me but like two seconds. Alrighty, so I have this expression, which is a factor of the expression. So, I mean, you've got answers down there. You could do like long division with all your answers if you wanted to, but really I think the best thing probably to do would just put on your big boy and girl pants and factor, even though you don't like it. So in order to factor this, I'd first like to factor out a GCF if there is one. There isn't one, so I'm just gonna have to go with what this is. Six times 10 is 60. So two numbers that multiply to give me 60 and combine to give me 19, and the signs are the same, it's gonna have to be four and 15. So this will give me 6x squared minus 4x minus 15x plus 10. So my group here, I can factor out a 2x here. That leaves me with 3x minus 2. Here I can factor out a negative 5. So that leaves me with 3x minus 2. This is going to give me 2x minus 5 times 3x minus 2. And so there's not a 2x minus 5, but that there is a 3x minus 2. All right, the figure below shows the graph of f. Use the figure to answer the following questions. I want the limit of the function as x approaches 0 from the right, from the positive side. So here is x at 0. As x approaches 0 from the right, y is also approaching 0. As x approaches 0 from the left, y is approaching 4. That's not the question, but you need to understand that you get different, sometimes, sometimes, not always, you get different things coming from two different directions. So this, this right here just wants it from the right. So as x approaches 0, so does y. Your answer is C. So that concludes the second video for the first part of the review, and then I will do a separate one for the green one.